Hey, hey, all of you players out there, players, playerettes, do do dudettes, amigos, amigas, everybody in between, welcome back. This is going to be episode 95. Wow. 95, man. 95 of Game of Crimes. I am Morgan Wright. I am the host with the most hair, here literally with my partner in crime. Hey, everybody. It's Murph. Welcome back. Welcome back. And we got some interesting stuff, too, so we'll talk about it here. But before we get into it. Just some quick housekeeping. Head on over to Apple, Spotify, hit those five stars. We really appreciate it. We don't know how it works. It's magic, but I, uh, I'm telling you, it really helps us out a lot. So we really appreciate it. If you guys go over there, leave us your comments. Let us know what you think of the guests, the show. We're doing everything we can to make this as entertaining as possible for you. Also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com, as you saw with episode 94 and Ken Croak. We got great books on there. He, I mean, he had a fabulous book. I know, Murph, you said that that was just like, that was Couldn't a page put it down. Yeah. Page Couldn't turn. put it down. Yep. And we've got some other guests coming up, too. I'll have to tell you about the two. Um, one of them that I ran into. I'll tell you later. I want to. I don't want to spoil the surprise here, but somebody I ran into yesterday at a luncheon, 43 years in the game at the cap, at DC Metro homicide and also the head of the Supreme Court police. All right. Interesting stuff. He's got a book, too, which is very good on use of force. We'll talk about. Also, follow us on that thing called social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter. Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, pay homage to our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato. Head on over to Game of Crimes fans. Just go to Facebook, type in Game of Crimes fans. That's our fan page. Answer a couple questions if you're deemed worthy of entrance to the inner sanctum. You shall be allowed. And that's where hilarity ensues, Murph. A lot there of, you go. A lot of sh- slinging, a lot of memes and crap and uh, everything else there's no politics that shit's not allowed on there but there's some fun Runs stuff it with an there. iron fist no politics but we do have a good time by the way <laughs> we apologize in advance if you go to our game of crimes fans page sandy and a couple others posted it it's like we should have warned them sorry no trigger warnings on these episodes you've been warned Epi- the second half of the episode murph uh-huh. where they talked about why they were going to rename that one guy to blood clot <laughs> Oh, oh God! See, <laughs> then, oh, oh, oh. Mm. yeah. We we apologize for that, but hey, man, if you're listening, it's on you. It's not on us. We <laughs> warned you guys this stuff was going to be bad. But uh, hey, there's it, some there are some sick people out there. If you haven't figured it out yet, there's some and sick they're outlaw out motorcycle there. gangs, the pagan. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but hey, we we apologize for that in advance. But hey, head on over there and you'll see what we're talking about. Also, go to Patreon.com/slash Game of Crimes. That's where we just got through recording an episode, and this was because we blamed Lori Walker for this. She put the idea in our head. So we just did a review of the Netflix series on the 30th anniversary of Waco. Yeah. Uh, and, and Lori, thank you very much for the idea. We're just we're giving you a hard time. No, uh, we're, we're blaming her. <laughs> <laughs> we blame you. Uh, yeah, no, it was. We got in. We we did an in depth discussion of what went right, what went wrong there, and we we pull no punches. We're not going to do it on our free stuff because you know we don't want to look like Monday morning quarterbacks, armchair quarterbacks. But we did give a critical um, analysis of what we thought happened on that thing. So if you want to go over find out what we're talking about, go over to patreon.com slash game of crimes. We've got nine one one. What's your emergency? We got you can't make this shit up. Uh, we've got our narco meter review. Uh, we Q&A. do Q and A, which is one of the fun point ones. Yeah, yeah. Murph looks forward to that every day because he learns new words every time. Yeah. So I learned new ways to give Morgan the finger because uh, you know we only release audio, but we do this on video so we can see each other. So uh-huh. I can I can send him surreptitious surreptitious messages <laughs> during the recording. <laughs> Secret messages. Murph, just say secret. Surreptitious. Uh, here, look, here's a double. <laughs> here's a double. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so head on over there and find out what's going on. Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Now, folks, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but... As you can already tell, we don't take ourselves serious at all. <laughs> we want to have some fun on here with you guys. And because we don't take ourselves seriously, that means it's... Guess what time it is, Murph? I bet it's time for... Small, Small town, town police blotter. Yay! All that stuff. Hey, and uh, I just decided to just uh, uh, throw out some shit. I actually have a couple things for you. Um, we'll, we'll, I laid off those weird state laws because some of those were just like dorky. I couldn't find anything that was really funny. But however, Mer- yeah. All right. A Kansas man is behind bars after leading police on a high speed chase Tuesday night. Police were called around 9 46 p.m. for a complaint. When they arrived, they found an abandoned car and immediately started hearing calls about an erratic driver on the road near the town of Ellenwood, Kansas, population 1,951. Salute. Salute. 
I know where Ellenwood is, folks. Uh, this, <laughs> this is this is my home state. There. It turns out that this complaint, the vehicle this person was driving, had been stolen, and the driver wasn't planning on getting caught anytime soon. They chased down rural roads and into the city over the next hour. They were doing this for an hour during the chase. The police, I, I, you know, it's going to be amazing the speeds they got to. I'm going to hold off on for a second. This is it's totally amazing. The, this this idiot hit numerous telephone poles, a police car that was being used as a block, and a 2005 Chevy truck that was parked on the road. The whole ride finally came to an end when police fired 18 rounds Ooh. and disabled the vehicle. Wow. This is Kansas. Now, he hit how, multiple telephone poles. How did he survive that? Because he was driving a combine. Oh. <laughs> Speeds got up to 15 miles an hour. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> he, is, he is a fucking John Deere... Mac- you know, dude, John uh, this, Deere Green. This, Nothing runs like a deer, apparently. This is this is like the uh, the uh, rural version of the OJ speed chase. <laughs> the low speed chase in a combine. I've arrested guys out of a combine before. I got a guy driving in a combine. I got a guy driving in a John Deere 4450 tractor, drunk as hell, and they oh I've had a tractor. Still a motor vehicle under the law, there, Skippy. <laughs> Dang, I didn't see that one coming. All right, this is another one, though, too. This is another Kansas one. This is hilarious. Ryan Malik, 23, was named in a municipal court complaint accusing him of exposing himself with the intent of arousing or gratifying sexual desires. He's been summoned to appear. Cops say he was intoxicated when he committed his act in Newton, Kansas, population 18,602. Sad Luke. I know where Newton is, too. Mm-hmm. Great little city, uh, 25 miles north of Wichita. Local cops responding to a 911 call about a man beneath a uh, vehicle discovered Malik. And uh, he was oblivious when they initially was contacted. His blood alcohol content was later measured at more than four times the legal limit. They tased, they had to tase him and take him into custody. Uh, he has prior arrests for marijuana possession and aggravated assault. Guess what he was doing? I'm afraid to say. He was attempting to have sex with a tailpipe. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh. Oh. He was endeavoring to place his penis into the tailpipe of a car parked outside an apartment complex. Not even his own car. I've been drunk, but I've never been been that drunk. (laughs) Oh, my God. Holy cow. Oh, and this is Kansas? No, this is moved Kansas. out of there. What's going on out there? Oh, my gosh. Okay, last one. Another Kansan. A Randy Kansan. Randy means, you know, horny. Mm-hmm. Horny. Do I make you horny, baby? Has cut a plea deal to charges that he and a female companion were engaging in lewd behavior after swiping KY jelly and other items. Um, he pleaded last week no contest to a misdemeanor lewd and lascivious behavior charge and was sentenced to a year's probation. This dude was uh, having uh, public sex with a lady, Tina Gianacon, 35. So he's 22, she's 35. Apparently younger guys, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, after uh, witnesses observed them openly uh, having a uh, tryst. Um, Where? Walmart. <laughs> In the Walmart. I should have known. <laughs> They swiped the KY. They also pinched my doll, Maybelline eyeliners, socks, eye drops, and a styling gel. Oh. And then decided to celebrate by licks fornicate in front of the public. <laughs> oh, and they wanted to look good. Oh, my. You know, that mugshot, you could prepare for it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay. This, this should have been on You Can't Make It Shit Up. <laughs> it may end up on there. I don't know. <laughs> Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I've already got tears in my eyes, and, and we haven't started talking about our, our episode today yet. Yeah, well, <clears throat> and those will be different kind of tears, trust me. So, hey, back on, uh, I want you guys to know, back on April 6th, we blame this one now on Alex Campbell. Alex Campbell messaged me uh, on Facebook, uh, taking availing himself of what we tell you guys. This is how we can be reached. And he said, hey, Morgan, you should try to get uh, in touch with Sergeant Kevin Holtry of the Boise Police Department. I'd love to get someone of the podcast from on the podcast from my city. And I think that he would be an awesome guest for the podcast. I won't tell you the rest of it because we're going to talk about it with Kevin. Mm-hmm. But so, Alex, uh, here you go. We uh, So, again, the, how we did it is uh, Wayne Stinnett, right, reached out to him. And then through a way, we were able to get back in touch with uh, Kevin Holtry, re- retired yep. sergeant from Boise PD. 
Yeah, I tried to track uh, Kevin down. I couldn't find a way to get a hold of him, but uh, our buddy Wayne Stanett out in Oklahoma comes through every time. He's he's responsible for a lot of the guests that we've had on here. In fact, we're going to get Wayne on here eventually uh, to tell his story. But who's going to get a hold of Wayne to get Wayne to get Wayne on the podcast? Well, him, I have his contact information. Okay. I know how to find Wayne. <laughs> and, and if we can't, we go back to Brian Suber. Yeah. Because yeah. he works with him. Uh, anyway, uh, through Wayne's contacts, he found some, he had some connections in uh, Idaho who were able to reach out and touch base with uh, today's guest, Kevin Holtry. He was a sergeant with the Boise Police Department. Uh, as you're going to hear his story here, in 2016, he was shot multiple times uh, as they were trying to apprehend an individual. That had already killed two other people. Yeah, and you're going to hear the what really happens after a shooting. You know, we've had multiple officers on here that have been shot in the line of duty, and they tell their stories, and it's all heart-wrenching. But wait till you hear what happened to Brian. This is this. I mean, Kevin. I'm sorry. It brings it to a whole new level. And and, and as as you're going to hear, I mean, the emotion is still there. And he was shot in, in 2016, and here we are in 2023. The emotion is still there. The the lifelong lasting effects of what he went through are just horrible. He's going to be real honest with you, which I I just got to take my hand off to him for being yeah. so transparent here. Um, and I'll tell you, if you don't have, if you have dry eyes at the end of episode two on, on this, you interview, got no fucking heart. Yeah. You're a cold person. And, and let me tell you too, we didn't, I intentionally did not edit out certain things in here because I wanted you guys to understand what he went through and not mm-hmm. only that, but what he went through to be on the podcast with us. There are some very painful points in this podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm telling you that without a doubt so far, we've had a lot of like Joe Pierce a lot of good stuff there, you know, TJ Webb. But this one, I, I tell you right now, and for a couple of reasons, we don't want to give it all away because there's some other things involved in this. But by far for me, the most emotional episode from a personal, I, I got choked up. I mean, it was like, well, even now good. it's like I'm getting chills, the, the discussion we had. So I did very little editing on this because I wanted you folks to understand not how much of a hero this guy is, but what he went through to tell his story. And it was, pain- I'm telling you, it's painful. It was painful to watch on video what he went through as we had to take breaks. Yeah. It's and I was getting ready to say the same thing. I got chill bumps here just thinking about it. This is God bless you, man. It, it Kevin for being so open and honest in what you're trying to do now, and and that's the motivational part of this. And and we've got a surprise for you. Next week's episode is going to be another Boise officer who was instrumental in working with Kevin and saved his life. You're so going to we'll just. just- be very similar to the episode we did with you and Kevin, which is we've got the two points of view of what went on. Yeah. Um, which is going to be very – so you're going to hear it from uh, uh, Kevin's side. Then you're going to hear it from Brian Holland's side. Um, and I think it's this is going to be real interesting because we're going to tag team the episodes together. But we can't get to that episode, Murph, unless I ask you, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most tear-jerking, Kleenox-using – game of all the game of crimes hey everybody i'm telling you on this one get your tissues out now and get in sit down shut up and hold on what you're going to hear but it's just this is superhuman what you're getting ready to hear God, we already got a smart ass on the line here. Not the half tree, the whole tree. <laughs> well, my whole life I've been called poultry, gold tree, dole tree, soul hey, poultry, tree. that's good. Are you chicken or what? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> when I worked in the jail, the female inmates, and I'm a little proud of this, they're like, oh, it's deputy soul tree. And I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> Heaven soul tree is what they used to call me. Just soul tree. So in <laughs> case you guys are wondering who we got on, we got our guest of the hour, the man of the hour, mm. Kevin, not half tree, but the whole tree, Kevin whole tree. That's right. So, hey man, welcome to Game of Crimes, brother. I appreciate it a lot. I'm, it's an honor. I pre- I'm glad to be here. Yeah, now that we now that you got it figured out, it was, I'm almost going to have to send a trooper over to get you back online here. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here Just we so go. our listeners know, we've been busting on troopers since we started warm ups. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. You know why? <laughs> you, you, jealousy, no, dude. No, it's not. But I can tell you, when I went to the academy, I never once. Uh, you probably know the name of it, the like drag box to figure out what the friction is on tires. Yeah. And all I used that. to use those. Yeah. Yeah, what, not, what in the early the friction, 60s? We used to call it like the friction sled or the drag yeah. sled. So you, yeah. So like 1960, 61. Oh, that's 
around when I was born. Look, asshole, <laughs> this is going to be a very short interview if you keep this shit up. You haven't been on long enough to in- insult me like that. I just well, so you're you both, a trooper. I have to do it. So you both get it right. You're trying to figure out what the coefficient of friction is. That's, That's what right. That's right. And go. the way you figure it is you look at the weight of the object and you look at how many pounds oh. it takes to break friction and then you can determine what the coefficient of friction is. Hey, but no, hey, no, I no. digress. We, just, we came screaming down the street in our cruisers and locked it up at 50 just miles an hour to see how far you slide. So, uh, well. <laughs> see, you guys see, you guys are still living the dream. I'm telling you, man. Still uh, well, living the dream. Yeah, I missed we, my calling. Uh, uh, no, you didn't. <laughs> it definitely wasn't in technology, man. <laughs> no. Uh, hey, neither we, is. Before we get started here, we got to give a shout out to our uh, our good friend out in Oklahoma, um, Wayne Stanett. Wayne Stanett. When, uh, he comes through again. Wayne's worse than a freaking informant. He rats out everybody. Man, well, he and I don't think he knew you, did he, Kevin? He he knew somebody that did know you. Yeah, he said he got an email from somebody saying, "Hey," and I don't know how this guy knows me, but some the, I, I didn't recognize the name, but I think he had gotten a hold of your buddy in, in uh, Tulsa, and just said, "Hey, why don't you try to reach out to this guy?" So he called me, and I, you know, I'm always. I think I've done several podcasts and a lot of uh, speaking engagements throughout the country at gang conferences and so forth. And and so it might have been one of those. But, yeah, I'm just glad he was able to put us into contact with each other. And Well, the guy that sent him the email, his name was Steve Murphy. (laughs) That was me. (laughs) But, but Morgan, we got uh, this came. uh, Kevin's suggestion came in from one of our listeners, right? Yep, it absolutely did. Was it Alex Campbell? So, yeah, Alex Campbell. Yeah. So shout We're, out to Alex too. He he lives in Idaho. He said, you know, we he said, uh, you know, you guys have all, have heroes on from all the states. We'd like to hear about a hometown hero. How about Kevin Halftree? Holtree, Poultry. Soul Poultry. <laughs> soul tree. The Soul Tree man. You guys got it. <laughs> soul tree. No, hey, but shout out to Alex Campbell. We do and actually we we'll be doing a um Patreon episode case of the month on Waco mm-hmm. uh, because somebody asked for that. So we're going to analyze I had a friend of mine who was a commander at Waco, uh, actually the SWAT team when that was going on. Mm. So there'll be some interesting stuff out of that, but we digress. Yes, of course we do. Let's, and that's our, we have a drinking game. So if I digress and I say, Hey, I, but I digress, uh, you get, you get to drink. So okay. name your beverage. Okay. Coffee. Not, Let's go. You got it's coffee. not water. It's vodka. You got <laughs> boys. Is that boy, is that a Boise state coffee cup? Yep. My alum Boise All right. state on the, the mighty Broncos. Well, why are mighty you, Broncos. why are you wearing a Boston hat? Oh, because my sister used to live in Boston, and I'm a huge baseball fan. In fact, I was should turn it off, but I got the Boston game on behind me, and I was watching it. <laughs> and uh, I used to go there, and I would uh, I'd go to every Red Sox game I could go to because in Idaho we don't have really a pro sports program, and I loved it. And I'd sit there and you know drink a beer and hang out, and I met I just I just became a fan by going to Fenway, and I I'm, I've always been a baseball fan, so yeah. Well, you may have to scoot over one way or the other so I can see the game or while we do this interview. <laughs> it's, not, it's, like, it's like 10 to 1 socks, so let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's go. Hey, well, as we do with everybody, thing yeah. of ours, Cosa Nostra. Yeah. How did you get started in this thing of ours? Were you a youth at Boise State and you got, you know, you got nabbed by the campus cops a couple times or like, say, urinating in public and you decided, hey, I want to be a cop. I, I wanted to be a trooper, but I might not qualify because I went to Boise State. But <laughs> how, how did this Your thing come about? Big. I'll tell you how it came about was when I was, and this sounds weird. It's kind of, and I don't, I won't get into the the super long. If you haven't heard last week's episode too, by the way, we forgot to apologize in advance. You want to hear something that sounds weird. We'll tell you about episode two last week with Ken Crow. But anyway, that's nothing sounds weird anymore. Trust me. And even if you you crapped your pants, you can talk about that on here, Kevin Black. (laughs) I'll do it. (laughs) No, it kind of went like a, I grew up, uh, not to get into, you know, all the details of, uh, my family, but I do remember when I was about two years old, uh, my biological dad split. Um, I have an older sister who was two years older than me and, uh, it was pretty rough for a while. We lived in, she, I don't know why she went to Portland, Oregon of all places, but we lived there for a little bit. And for some reason there was a guy in this ghetto ass apartment building we lived in my mom was putting windows into a mobile home factory and uh working you know just trying what doing what she could do and uh there was a guy in a wheelchair ironically enough and he was a vietnam vet and he had uh gotten blown up and 
he used to do wheelies in his wheelchair and I'd talk to him and he was, uh, he talked, <laughs> I, I just, the, he talked to me about combat, not graphically, but just about the war and, and about, uh, you know, our country and what we have and what the greatest country in the history of mankind. And I don't know, it kind of, even as a young boy, and I'm talking like four or five at this point, I remember that. And so as I grew up, my mom remarried, thank God, or else I'd be in prison. But my step in this uh, coming up, it's going to be their 50, 50th anniversary, year, oh, 50th cool. w- wedding anniversary, still married. Very cool. And he kind of straightened me up. And uh, I just, uh, I I don't know. He He's a patriot. So was I. And, and when I was in high school, I got some, uh, some uh, not D1, but D2, like uh, football scholarship offers and what position i was a center uh played offensive line uh six one about 245 in high school so i could have put on about another 10 pounds and uh anyways i decided i didn't want to do that i wanted to go in the army because i knew that my parents were financially unable to pay my dad drove a truck his whole life we're just very humble blue collar you know people and uh i decided i said you know what I'm going to join the army. And so I went, joined the army was in the third. Where'd you go through basic? Uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Fort Leonard Wood, misery. Oh God, God forsaken places, man. It was like, (laughs) that's the first time I ever experienced humidity in my whole life. And it almost killed me. (laughs) Really? Oh yeah. Jesus. I got off the bus and I bought shit myself. I was like, God, what is getting, I was sweating. It was horrible, but I did, uh, did my years there. I was stationed in Germany. It was awesome. And then, uh, what was your MOS? Uh, 13 Bravo and then 11 Bravo. So field artillery infantry. and infantry. Yeah. So yeah. if you're big enough to carry an M60, I was a 60 gunner. And I was about to ask you that you yeah. had to be carrying the heavy weapons, man. Yeah, they're like, Hey, that guy's big. Let him do it. So I did it. <laughs> and, uh, anyways, I got out and I, uh, I went to Boise state and how long were you in, in what the army? Yeah, this is not a complicated question. Well, yeah. I didn't know if you meant Boise state cause I kind of <laughs> ebbed and flowed, but, uh, no, yeah. How long were you in the army? Oh, over, it was like three and. Okay. Three. So you can't just roll through that. You have a couple stories. Come on. Either non-judicial punishment, article 15. No, never, up. never, no, never, nothing? never. You didn't do anything? Never. Well, you had to have well, a little I, fun, especially if you're over in Germany drinking beer, big guy. No, no, no. I drank plenty of beer. Trust me. I drank my body <laughs> weight in beer, but no, I never, I, I, I knew, you know, I'm, you, the, you you could find trouble. It's like anything else, man. If it's if you want to do dirt, you can do dirt. And you know, I just that wasn't my jam. I was never. I, I'm not super straight laced, but I just I wasn't gonna steal. I wasn't gonna. You know, I got in a couple. You know, dust ups and you know, of course. You, but that that just happens. And so, were you a member of the E3 Mafia? E3 Mafia. You know, the Where E3s. I, you're are, always an E3? <laughs> no, no. That's, that's guys I know in the Marine Corps that got oh. busted back all the time. But no, oh. we would call them the E3 Mafia, the ones that would go, you know, they, they you kind of, once you got a little bit of rank and a little bit of, you got a little bit salty, then you started becoming, you know. No, I was an E4P. Um, uh, they were going to promote me, but the numbers were too high and it was the best position I ever held because I had enough seniority that I could, you know, you'd be the boss. But I didn't have the responsibility of being an NCO and all that kind of stuff, and so. So what's let people know what an E four P because they used to have special oh. corporals used to be E uh, fours and then they became yeah, yeah. spec fours. But what's an E four P? Well, E uh, four uh, is a spec four, right? And then if you go to the uh, NCO academy, basically to learn how to be a sergeant, then you get the designator P, which is promotable. So I'm E four promotable. So I was an E four P, but you know, they change, you have to have a certain number of points to get promoted and the points were real high. And anyways, long story, I ended up getting out and, uh, started yeah, going. We're to, not, we're not done with the army yet. Though. Okay. Hold on, pal. Hold what do you, on, okay. Pal. <laughs> now, did you, did you ever, did you ever get to do anything? Did you do air assault, uh, you know, nope. um, airborne, anything? No. When you're in Germany, you're kind of on an Island. In fact, the base where I was stationed is a small town called Schweinfurt. And we stayed in barracks that the Germans used in World War II, so they were old, rough. No, <laughs> the the yeah. the ba- the base itself. We were right down on the Czechoslovakian border, and so we were kind of like the coal mine canaries, where 
if the the Russians and the East Germans were going to come through what's called the Fulda Gap, which is the main area they could get through the mountains, our life expectancy was about 10 minutes, enough to make a few phone calls and saying, hey, we're getting our asses kicked here. And then they would send in whoever. So that's what I did. We hiked What around. years was that? Shit. 85 to 89. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. You were still there when it was called the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, a. I mean, I was right there at the peak of the Cold War when, uh, was it Gaddafi that got killed? They killed him. That was a big deal. But yeah, it was all, it was just, uh, you know, you, the, the Berlin Wall was still up. I mean, all that kind of stuff. So that was right about the time Reagan said, you know, Mr. Yep, Gorbachev, tear take, down this yep, wall yep, and thing. That yep. was kind of the, they were headed down that way. Hey, we're going to get right back with Kevin in just a second. But in the meantime, we are glad to welcome back not only one of our favorite sponsors of the show, but one of our tastiest sponsors of the show. Oh, yeah. It's HelloFresh. Hey, guess, guys, guess what? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre portioned ingredients, seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. I'm going to tell you about it. So skip the trips to the grocery store, count on HelloFresh to make your home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Let me tell you what, Murph. Good food is too precious to waste, right, man? Oh, yeah. Everything, what I loved about this is everything is pre-portioned. Um, I can just dole it out. And you cut down on your food waste by at least 23%. You think about how much stuff you throw out, but it's 23% compared to grocery shopping, which is good for your wallet and the planet. Well, and like you just said, we're all looking for ways to save money. HelloFresh is cheaper than going to the grocery store and shopping there. It's 25% cheaper than takeout. I mean, now we do a lot of takeout. So the fact that I'm saving 25%, you know I'm cheap. I'm easy and cheap. <laughs> and no cat food in this one, though. So HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with over 40 recipes. I'll tell you what I made last night. What'd you I'm a meatloaf fan, dude. Meatloaves oh. with creamy mushroom sauce with green beans and garlic mashed potatoes. Yeah, baby. I'm telling you, mm, uh, I just... I, I want to make another. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> well, and and I think we're going to do that one next because the one we had was the chicken over garlic Parmesan spaghetti with Tuscan roasted tomatoes. And you know what I love about this? Everything you need is in the packet. You don't have to go buy some special spice. They put everything in there for you. And I'm telling you, everything we've had so far is top-notch tasty. And, and look, my wife is is very picky about meat, chicken, pork, stuff like that. So if it passes her taste test, you know it's good. So no worries if you're not a pro in the kitchen. Look, if I can do it, you can do it. HelloFresh's foolproof recipes arrive pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps. So go to HelloFresh.com slash GOC50. Folks, this is a great offer. And use code GOC50 for 50% off. Plus your first box ships free. That's HelloFresh.com slash GOC50 and use code GOC50 for 50% off plus your first box free. So, folks, there's a reason why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. So, great stuff. Let's get back to Kevin now. Absolutely. But I'm a big history buff, too. And so, I went to, I've been to Dachau, went to the concentration camp. Probably so, talk, talk about that for a second. Now, that's, see, that's why we want to dig there's gold in that. What was it like? Because Steve and I have both visited uh, the Holocaust Museum in D.C., but nothing, uh, you just can't, because the reason I say that, I just saw an article where some model got excoriated and she should have, she kind of took some modeling pictures in, in front of one of the concentration camps. I don't know if it was Dachau or whatever, but just, you don't, there's certain stuff you don't do. What was it like to visit that being a history guy? Uh, it, it was, it was horrifying to be quite frank. I mean, you got to keep in mind, I mean, the main administrative building was still intact and the, sc the, the size, the scope of the, the footprint of Dachau is massive, way bigger than I thought. I thought it would might be like 10 buildings. I mean, you could put Ohio, you could put the big house from Ohio state, you could put it in the middle of where Dachau is. I mean, it's that big. And so the, I guess the most sobering thing was to go into the actual gas chamber, which they allowed you to do, and you could stand in it. And you have this sort of feeling internally where you think about the hundreds of thousands of women, children that were killed there, and they still have the ovens intact. 
And you could stand two feet from these little brick ovens with a slide out tray. And they had like meat hooks where they would hang people and slide them around, you know, the ceiling and, and drop them off in there. And, you know, they had a, it was very somber. I mean, I don't even think I heard anybody talk the whole time I was there. Uh, they had a memorial for, you know, all the Jews that were killed there. Uh, you know, going through the front gate and they have the, the most classic German phrase of all time that everybody knows, which says, Arbeit macht frei, which is work makes you free or work makes one free. And so every person that went through there read that and they, they told them, if, you know, you're here to work and some work, but the vast majority were killed. And so it was just, you know, it's just, it's just very, very sad. I mean, that humans can do that to one another. I don't care what your beliefs are. It was just, it was, I, I was very, I was very fortunate to go, I think, because it was, you know, it was just, it was just amazing, you know? And I went down to uh, a French commando school down in uh, what's called the Verdun Gorge. The, the French is the, Gorge du Verdun, which is kind of their Hell's Can, their Hell's or their uh, Grand Canyon, and uh, we got done a week early, and we went down to the French Riviera. And I'm, we're talking, I'm like 19 years old, and I'm in Saint Tropez and Cannes and Nice, there, and, baby. Yeah, that's great, baby. Hustling women as much <laughs> as I could, and they were. We had so and, much fun. <laughs> and how is it you did not get in trouble? Because I'm smooth as silk, baby. You can't get in trouble. Jesus. He got down there. It was Kevin Sultry at that point. Yeah, I was Kevin gonna, Sultry. Amen. Amen. The girls, you know, they're like, you know, they can't speak English and we can't speak whatever Portuguese or whatever. They're, you know, at the time they were speaking, you know, we ran into so many people. But yeah, it was, it was, I, I wish I could go back and enjoy it a little bit more because I'd have more, what you, whatever, you, what am I trying? I would have more, uh, I would Appreci enjoy it more, you know, yeah, a better perspective. Yeah, a, a more of appreciation for it now. And Germany's in a great country, and it's, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I learned to speak the language a little bit, and uh, I still kind of enjoy it. And um, So what was your favorite beer over there in Germany? You know, the beer. For I'm the a, free, I'll say free beer. That's what <laughs> I was going to say. No. <laughs> Um, it was Bud Light. Drank oh so much what? Bud Light. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even have. I don't know. <laughs> they, I don't they, think they had Bud Light. They back don't. Then. I'm, I'm just trying to make a current mm. joke, but yeah, you <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was fabulous. Um, no, it was a. Uh, <laughs> it was just half of Eisen or a Pills or a Pilsner. You know, they whatever. I don't care. I was like I said, 19 years old, so I'd drink whatever they had. Did you get and, any German girlfriends? I had one that I kind of, you know, hung out around with for a little bit. She was a lot of fun. Um, did you show her your wiener schnitzel, did you? Oh, come on now. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. She, she, didn't, she didn't typically carry a magnifying glass. And so... <laughs> <laughs> I like it. The reason I'm saying that is you have to watch you have to watch Blazing Saddles. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. Don't get me started on Blazing. My in fact, my dad, we watched Blazing Saddles. I, I watched it the other day. It's a, that's one that you can't get away with that stuff now. But it was you could fun. not make that movie so again. Funny Blazing Saddles is a legit movie. Very funny. Oh my god, <laughs> it was one of a kind. I'm sorry, it? baby. Mm -hmm. Twelve Schnitz and Grubins are my limits. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Oh man. Well that, but so how was that? Was that your first time going anywhere? I assume outside the country. Uh, I, I went to Mexico once on, on a vacation with my folks and my grandparents and that's it, man. I mean, I, you're talking, I'm a third generation out of Hoenn. I'm not like shit a year and a half ago. And I can talk about it a little bit later, but there's an outfit called the challenge athletes foundation, which is based out of San Diego. And they have a big fundraiser down there and shit a year and a half ago, I went down there and swam the swim leg of a triathlon, which I think was a mile. And I, at the, so I'm paralyzed. I'm missing a leg. My other one hadn't been cut off yet. And I'm out there and I've never been in the ocean my whole life. Okay. I have never been, I've never swam in the ocean. So I went down to San Diego 
and where they surf. And so the waves were pretty big and I got crushed, but I ended up making it. It was, it was a lot of fun. I was really proud of that. So, so we are going to, and we kind of gave away some of it way to go. Cause I was saving that for later, but he let the cat out of the bag. We're going to talk about what happened to you, but you guys kind of get an idea of that's okay. It's your podcast. This is your episode. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Kevin half tree. When, when, right. when you're talking about Idaho and how, where I've been, I'm just saying, I, I love Idaho so much that I don't need to go anywhere else. You know, I, I obviously I have since then. I'm not a rube, but yeah. I've, you know, I love Idaho. I love everything about it. I love the people. I love the, I'll send, I, I, I'll send I, you guys a picture of me. I shot an, a nice six point bull elk two years ago out of my wheelchair, wow. which I thought was pretty cool. Oh yeah. And so I love to hunt. I grew up hunting. Did you remember uh, to put the brakes on your wheelchair before you pulled the trigger? Damn straight I did. I, cause I, I, was, I won't tell you where I was, but I was on a real s- s- steep. S- yeah, I would have. Oh, yeah. You would have got a lot of speed going downhill, huh? L- let me tell you one thing about being in a wheelchair. You learn to put your brakes on really <laughs> quick into the process. It's, it's like one of those things. It's like forgetting to put your shoes on when you leave the house. You learn how to put your damn shoes on real quick. Uh, real quick. Yeah, that's kind of how it is. Well, and I'm glad we did this little diversion because just, you know, your appreciation for history. My dad was a World War II and a Vietnam vet. So yeah, my I, grandfather I mean, was a World War II vet. So so anytime I'm over in Europe or places like that, one, my big thing on my bucket list to visit, I still want to go visit Normandy. I've not been to Normandy yet. And just the, just the you know, just the reverence you have for places like that. But it, it, I was glad you were talking about just a little diversion to find out because some of this, but the reason I ask is that appreciation from being in Dachau actually had to, I'm just projecting here, just thinking that forward is that that had to have an impact on you later in law enforcement in terms of appreciating the impact an authority could have on a civilian population. Yeah, for sure. And you, in your head, you have to register and this may be a little cliche, but there has to be protectors in this world. Okay. I mean, it's just that simple. Sheep, sheep, dogs, and wolves. Yeah. I mean, you can use whatever you want to use, but there has to be somebody that men that stand up, you know, that answer the call eventually. And whether it's military, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's firefighting, whether it's paramedics, I don't care. There's a certain gratification and a and an honor in uh, protecting your your country and protecting your community, and I've, I'm proud of it. And I don't regret you know one second of anything I've done up to this point. Nothing. Very well said. I mean, if well we said, if brother. if our listeners don't remember anything else from the podcast, that right there are words of wisdom. That's why we have Game of Crimes. Uh, you know, firefighters. So uh, we'll have to talk about that, whether or not. Uh, you know. <laughs> Be nice now. No, I, I hey, one of these days we might even have a firefighter on here. You never know. If I've we can a, find one that did anything more than rescue a cat out of a tree or sleep. Here's what I did. Here's my lazy boy where I slept at last night. Well, you guys are you're laughing a bit. I played hockey for man my entire adult life, and we played on a fire police team, and mm-hmm. so I knew a lot of the firefighters, and so. You know, shit. When I was working night shift on patrol, we'd go to their whatever station, and I knew where they slept, and we'd park right underneath their windows, and then hit the siren or the air horn. <laughs> and I knew I was waking them up, and then we'd laugh, you know, and giggle, and go tearing out of there. You know, during the good days when you're not going to get in trouble for doing yeah. some, you know, just a practical <laughs> joke. But yeah, those guys, they're they're awesome, and it's always that it, that camaraderie between police and fire it's awesome yeah oh it is we we give them a hard time but uh you know but our brothers and sisters in blue red you know you name it uh, we're all we're all in this together so yep I, when i was a uniform officer they built the new city hall and they put the police department <laughs> uh locker room and weight room right over top of the sleeping quarters of the main fire station <laughs> 3 a.m is a great time to lift weights slam those babies <laughs> Right, that digression was on Murph, not me. So if you want to drink, you got to drink milk of magnesia or kale pectate or something. If it was me, you'd get a good Belgian beer out of it. But sorry about that. Some folks. prune juice right here for you boys. Right, yeah. Some prune juice. Madam All right. Come yeah. on now. You're speaking Murph's song there. <laughs> All right. Hey, well, let's. So you did your time in the army. Um, now, did you get some? Did the G, part of it too? I assume was you used the GI Bill to go to college. I did. In fact, uh, that's one of the main reasons. Sorry. The sec- <laughs> ah, yeah. 
So you guys notice we took a little pause there because Kevin started getting a little pain. Um, tell everybody what that was because you, you said something that grabbed my attention too. You still have a bullet in you near your vertebra. I have three bullets still inside of me. The one, <clears throat> excuse me, the <clears throat> the one that causes me, I, well, all my grief is I took the first bullet that I was hit with was kind of in my upper left ass cheek and it went up in a up because he was we'll get into it later but he was at a low he was lower than me he was hiding i got ambushed and he shot me from about maybe two feet away and it hit me in the butt but it went up into my spine and it just it just stuck right in my t11 vertebrae and it just it felt like i got hit with a sledgehammer and i just went face down and that was it. Everything was shut off from my belly button down, complete paralysis. It didn't sever my spinal cord, but it did cause what they, he, re, he explained. It was like a stroke. My spinal cord, no blood could get to it or something. So that was it, you know, for me right then. I, and he kept shooting me and I got shot five times and I was trying to turn over and shoot him. And Chris, who was my cover right next to me, one of the, Chris Davis was shooting him with his AR and you know again we, we can get into some of the details but that's caught the nerve it just you've seen as cops you've seen the ballistic gelatin right yeah so when a bullet hits it you see that big <laughs> cavitation inside the the yeah. gel and then it that that's essentially what happened to all the nerves coming out of my lower back it just blew them into a million pieces and so I get nerve spasms, you know, and they've tried all kinds of different things, but nothing really works. So I just have to deal with it. That's the and, bottom and line. This, and we didn't want a shortcut because this gets into a lot of what you were dealing with. We're going to talk about mental health and stuff later, but that, that damage, that, that, that nerve spasm you had, I put it on pause. Cause I mean, it, it I mean, we we're sitting here, Murph and I are both wincing, you know, and you feel helpless. Cause it's like, dude, I mean, you, you want to do something. It's like, what can I do? Well, a lot of people say that they go, God, I wish I could just at least, you know, take away 10%. If I could get my pain down to 50 shit, 70% of what it is now, 60%, I'd live a long and happy life, but it happens. I, it wakes me up about every two hours when I'm in bed. I wakes me up. I, when I drive the vibration from the road, you know, I have a, a tundra that has a seat you know that i can jump in with hand controls and i really can't drive further than about two or three hours because it just sends me into the, the stratosphere in terms so of pain. let's Good. so let's put a pin in that we're going to come back and visit that because mm -hmm. we want to talk about some fun stuff beforehand um yeah. but we were talking about boise state the gi bill mm -hmm. um and that was one of the reasons you got into the military because you're saying your parents obviously financially couldn't afford to send you but the gi bill during your time in the military that's what was going to help you get through college yeah and help me buy my first house you know and uh yeah i ended up deciding that it would be a really good idea to get a degree in literature with an emphasis or an English degree with an emphasis in Russian literature. And I was like, oh, that, yeah, I mean, I can see lots of job opportunities that, out there. For at the that. time, it seemed like a good idea, but it wasn't. <laughs> Isn't that what most was... E3s or E2s say? It seemed like a good idea at the, at the time first, Sarge. I yeah, didn't realize that, that, was, that was a big Russian I mean, I, population. I <laughs> but I will say this. I mean, from the writing aspect, it probably, and you know, as being coppers, that writing clear, concise, good police reports is an mm -hmm. art. And there's only about 5% order. of the guys that can do it. And right. I was, I, I won't say maybe I was 5%, but I was always proud of what I turned in because I wrote so much that I could write well, and that, that helped me. So that was a very good thing. Well, that always differentiates your paper from everybody else's when the attorneys see it and the other folks' oh, stuff, sure. they look like you got your shit squared away. My training officer, though, had a very succinct report for a DUI one night, saw drunk, arrested, saying, <laughs> that's, that's that was it. the report, you know, <laughs> <laughs> very clear. That's it. <laughs> saw a man with gun. I think we all have those. Shot him, <laughs> done deal. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a canine report. Saw a bad man, bit him. Bit him, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Bit him many times. So, um, but, but, uh, what prompted you to study 
English with a minor in Russian literature. I mean, where did that come from? Did that come from doing your time in Germany, the closeness to the uh, uh, Soviet threat? No, the, the English part of it, you know, growing up, I read. I was a voracious reader. I read all the voracious time. Voracious means a lot, Murph. Yeah. Just read a lot. You know what I this was doesn't very, understand I was a very words. hungry reader. You know what this and, means right here? Yeah. <laughs> I read and I... I one of my favorite authors was Ernest Hemingway. And part of that was because, you know, growing up, I was a, should I start a fly fishing when I was 10? And if you know anything about Ernest Hemingway, he lived in Sun Valley, which is in Idaho. And it's one of the most premier blue ribbon fisheries in the state or in the, in the world, really from spring creeks to, you know, freestone rivers, if you know any of that kind of stuff. And so I really liked Ernest Hemingway and I, so I was, I had convinced myself I was going to be the next great American writer. And so I got hooked up with some guys that I had gone to high school with that were guiding up there. And I decided in the summer I would guide and I lived on a ranch called the B bar B and, uh, it was, a, and I lived in a bunkhouse and all I would do is, uh, take people fishing, you know, every day. And it was awesome. And then I realized pretty damn quick that maybe I wasn't as good a writer as I thought I was. And so I needed to get a job. My cousin worked for the sheriff's department and just on a lark, I just went and I, I, uh, I did a ride along with him and I went, Holy shit. And there was one call an elderly lady and by, and I'm talking like mid eighties, I would say five feet tall, white hair, just like your grandma. That would be a youngster for you, Murph. Yeah, a youngster for Murph. But there was a guy parked in front of her house, and she was scared. And it's like three in the afternoon. And so we rolled up, and my cousin talked to him, and he said, the guy's like, yeah, I'm waiting for my friend. He lives in that house. And then the guy showed up, and they went. It was a nothing deal. But this lady was so grateful, and it the the feeling that it gave me that, she she called the police came we went inside her house we had some uh sanka <laughs> which is when you're sanka. Oh, I heard that. oh my god yeah. there is a blast from when the you're past. 85 years old you drink sanka yeah. and when you're offered a mug of sanka by an 85 you drink it you drink it so Absolutely. we had a cup of coffee and her and she was a widow um you know she had her husband had passed and so it was just sitting in her front room and making her, and we said, you know, we'll come make sure everything's cool. We'll drive by. And I loved it. I was like, what a great job where you can just go up and help people. They don't even know them, but the relief on her from the time we got there to the time we left was a complete 180 degree change. And I went, giddy up, man, this is cool. And so I... I knew the, you know, some people that work for the sheriff's department here in Ada County, which is the county that Boise's in and, uh, ended up getting hired, uh, worked in the jail for a year and a half, loved it, which sounds weird. I couldn't make a career out of the jail, but I learned a ton. And then, you know uh, what? It's funny you should mention that a lot of the folks we've talked to that started off in the jail, cause you know, some people, ah, you're jail, but you know what? It's like working at a restaurant. You want to talk about customer service. You want to talk about having to deal with people on their worst days. You want to talk about, look, you're in there unarmed, right? So you've got to figure out how do you de-escalate? How you're do you in talk a dorm to with 100 to 110 criminals that are there doing any, waiting for a mer whatever. And you're in there and you have to walk, and you're in an open facility and there's like eight pods. I mean, shit, the, I, there's probably 1,200 inmates in Ada County Jail and you either learn real quick or they make your life miserable yeah you get eaten alive yeah just by them screwing with you not like they're gonna shank you or something but they're just they would screw with you you know and make your your shift you know and so i was i enjoyed that a lot i was only in there for i think a year and a half and during that year i was testing with the city and then i got hired with bpd with boise police and the rest is kind of history Real quick, while you were in the jail, did you did anybody? I mean, because a lot of times Pete, you try and figure out how does contraband get into the jail. Anybody ever approach you about trying to smuggle contraband in? You know, any uh, any of the prisoners or? I will tell you the only contraband I ever really saw come through was, you know, a female inmate had come in with like some pills in her prison wallet and or 
<laughs> Sorry, prison wallet. I never heard it called that. I've never heard that. You guys know Her what I'm prison. talking about. I'm not oh, gonna. Yeah. <laughs> she was she was internally smuggling pharmaceutical pharmaceutical. Yes, she was internally a prison wallet. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I like that. Every, you know, every what do you once call in a it while, on guys? <laughs> Somebody'd sneak in like some tobacco and they'd smoke. But it was it was it wasn't. No, I never I don't know. I just never Never had that come across. It was, uh, I enjoyed working booking. You know, you'd rotate through because it was fun. It was exciting. Dudes would come in and go crazy. And you got the first time you ever really get to use, you know, go hands on with somebody and, you know, that kind of stuff. And then by the time I got out and went to the road after I went to the academy and all that stuff, I'd be driving down the road and I go, oh shit, that's, you know, Joe Snuffy. I know that dude. And then, you know, you find out he's got a warrant and then you arrest him. It was, I knew a lot of guys in Boise, you know, when I got out, I'd see him. So Yeah, you didn't we'd even have to ask him information for the booking form. I know your name, your middle name, your date of birth, height, weight, hair, and eye color. You know, yeah. I, I don't I'll fill out the booking form for no, you guys. I, I'd don't call worry. and I go, Does this, you know, dude that I know, does he have a warrant? Yeah, he's got a felony warrant for whatever. And I go, Well shit, let's go get him, you know. And that, my FTO, my training officer, is like, Hey, that was awesome. Good job. So hey, nice. Let's set some quick con quick context too. Tell everybody about Ada County. Boys Boise's in uh, Ada County, but talk talk about like, you know, population and stuff. Give us a th- thumbnail of what uh, what it's like up there. Okay, Boise uh, is a capital city. Um state houses here, you know, all the legislative legislator legislators. Um population now, I would say is maybe it, it, it and keep in mind in the last 4 years maybe five years, the population's just boomed like it has in Florida, right? Everybody wants to move to Florida, Texas, or Idaho, or Montana, you know, where it's more conservative. And so the valley, you know, there's uh, suburbs, but in a 20-minute drive, there's a million people roughly in the valley from Caldwell, Napa, Boise, Meridian, Garden City, et cetera, Eagle. Those are all cities that surround, you know, Boise. So there's about a mill. I got a buddy of mine that uh, actually he moved his family to Idaho. He got tired of living in California. He does air traffic control, so he's got a pretty good gig. But he flies. He he just gets on the plane, flies, and goes to work. He moved his family to Idaho. Hasn't looked back. I know a lot of people who's who are either cops, like in Huntington Beach. I know one gal, and he moved his family up here ten years ago to go to school and stuff. And he's going to retire in a couple years. But he flies back and forth to SoCal just to, uh, and he lives in Boise. His family lives in Boise. His wife and wow. two daughters. Firemen oh, do it. Wow. Tons of firemen do it. Tons. It's because they got a lot of time off. That's why. Yeah. And, and you know, when, when you we hire, they do have a lot of time off. But when we have openings, you know, we hire laterals and we hire, and I'm not kidding, man. It's uh, most of our, I guess, applicants now are from Portland, Seattle. LAPD. I wonder why. I know. LA- LAPD is down 1,000 officers. I know. And they're not going to fill it. It'd take them six, seven years to get back no, to that. They'll never, f- I don't no. think they'll ever fill it. You know why? Because nobody wants to go deal with that shit. I wouldn't. Right now. I wouldn't. Yeah. Um, another, oh, Vegas, Vegas Metro. We hire a lot of dudes from Vegas. I guess that's getting pretty, pretty rough down there. And a lot of it's not that the crime is bad, is that they, they just don't get that support, right? Right. From the community. I mean, right. Jesus, how'd you like to, how'd you like to be a cop in Chicago when they have yeah, no, 35 shootings a night? I mean, I just, I just can't even fathom. Or like this last weekend when we're doing this, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about, uh, last part of April, 2023, just to bookmark it. But they had those teenagers over the weekend go down and do a takeover of the entire downtown area. Cops are completely outnumbered. They're, they're doing stories of people who were just scared to death that they were going to get beat up or mm-hmm. killed. Some did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I I read all about that, and I just go, you, I, I just couldn't do it. No way. And, but you get what you ask for, right? If you want to defund, then you get yep. defunded that, police departments. That's what you get. That's right. You know, and even politics aside, but even when you cast them, you know, even the current mayor said she didn't consider it was uh, – um, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the word that, that they use, but it's just like we would have called it, you know, a debacle. This, this was like this was outrageous. Now nah, they're just misunderstood. You know, oh, yeah. they're just youths who need an outlet. They you know, blamed it because it. the weather was nice, and they yeah. were hungry. The new mayor said they were hungry, so they went down there to find food because they have no food. I'm like, that's the most bullshit thing I've ever heard in my yeah. life. 
But when you hear those things, that's what that's what drives a lot of people to go up to Idaho. Oh yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, can yeah, you imagine, imagine owning a house in Portland and there's people no. living right in front of your house and they're using your front lawn as a restroom and there's needles everywhere and you can't do anything about it and the police won't come. They won't take property crimes report. They won't arrest anybody because the DA won't prosecute anybody. I don't get it. It's it's completely insane. Our DA for Ada County, the lead, that's the her name's Jan Bennett, is an absolute beast. And she has been so good to the police department, so good to me. And she understands, you know, how important it is to have police and have a good police department and not lower your standards, you know? So I got to give a shout out to the uh, Orange County Sheriff's office here in Orlando. There's, we have a lot of problems in the County with uh, these young people with their jacked up cars Mm -hmm. going out and taking over major intersections and spinning around. You've seen Seen the videos and, you know, hitting people by mistake. And they went the other night to one of the major intersections there and locked up nine people and towed and pounded their little cars. Good. Sheriff, Sheriff says that's going to continue. And, and is that a major crime? No, but, you know, that's the beginning of anarchy of and chaos. Thing. It's, right. it's and never the major crimes. It really isn't. No. It's right. the, well, I mean, my God, look at uh, San Francisco. They're fl- the, the biggest, most pristine flagship Whole Foods couldn't Third, last one, 13 months. Yeah. Couldn't last a year in San yep. Francisco. And uh, in Chicago, they just closed four Walmarts. Four in one city. A lot, a lot of people are pulling out. Yeah. Which and is what some of these fathers should have done years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a different thing. <laughs> um, let's let's go back before we go too far down the rabbit hole. Let's yeah. go back to getting on Boise. So it took you a year and a half. Uh, or you were applying. How long were you applying? How long did it take you to get on the PD? I don't know. Ten months. Because, you know, when you you apply, and it's, and it's probably like most departments, you apply and then you go to... You pass the written test, and then you go to your oral, and then when you get done with that, then you do the background, which takes most of the time, and then you do your polygraph, and you know, just your standard hiring. And so it was. It it took about. Uh, I'm going to say ten months. It, it, but you it got on on your first try. Uh, second, was that your first second second try. try? Okay, second try. Why didn't you get on the first time? That's a good question. I think it, more of it was uh, it was this lack of preparedness on my part. I okay. just, I just, I don't want to say things come easy, but I'm, I'm pretty confident, and I don't like get too worried about stuff. And so I thought, well, I sure, could because pass- you have an English degree with a minor in Russian literature. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you can handle <laughs> exactly. anything. <laughs> I can do anything. <laughs> no, I just uh, they only had a few spots, and I think there's probably out of you know. A lot of competition. A hundred guys, you know, they had to take three. And so at the time, but when I came back, you know, a month later, it was, you know, I hit a, cause I, I'd been through it. And so I was more comfortable and prepared. And that's the thing, you know, when you're getting hired, you got to really be prepared to, for those interviews. Cause it, the oral interviews, everything it's 99% of it to be quite yeah, honest. They want to know, how are you going to react? What do you think? They don't expect you to be a cop at that point. No, they, they just want to know, yeah, what kind of personality do you have? Are you an easygoing guy? Are you a guy that comes in all puffed out and yeah, I can really crack some skulls. They don't want those kind of guys, you know, even if you can, you just need to tone it down. Just Skippy. Be, yeah. Just be humble. You know, it's not hard. My motto I, when I was an FTO, I told on the first day, I always told my trainees, I go, don't take yourself too serious because nobody else does. <laughs> and, I said, don't, and I said, don't think for one second that you're not replaceable. And I've seen a lot of guys go, I'm out of this unit or I'm going to quit and this place is going to fold. And like I was telling Murph, I go, <laughs> right. shit, they just hire somebody the next day. It's not, it's not <laughs> put, tricky. Put you- Put your finger in a bowl of water. If you pull it out and it leaves a hole, you're irreplaceable. Otherwise, you're not. You know what I used to tell some of my trainees and stuff? I said, just remember, dude, don't let it go to your head. Chicks dig ugly guys in uniforms, too. <laughs> so don't, right. don't, 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 don't get any illusion here. <laughs> yeah. No, the badge will get you what you need, but what you need is going to get your badge, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. That is a good way of putting it. I like that. So, uh, I was so going to use talk about- another word, but I'm going to hold off on that because I'm still... <laughs> We appreciate that. Hey, look, this is, you, you do whatever, you, this is, you can use profanity, you can say whatever you want. Just, you okay, know, I'll, I'll use women. America. Your badge will get you women, but that woman will get your badge. 
about well, that. <laughs> and people are going to scream and don't worry yeah. because it happens to guys too. You know, guys mm-hmm. follow women around mm-hmm. in uniform because there's something sexy about that. I, I guess um, it's the prison wallet thing. What I don't know. <laughs> I still, still, still struggling. What do you call it on a guy? If it's a prison wallet on a woman, what's it called on a guy? We just said they keistered it. You know, it's your standard keister. I called the females where it was a prison wallet because, you know, it's, it is what it is. It looks like a damn wallet. <laughs> oh, we're going to get hate mail on this. That's okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. okay. Hey, we got to have a sense of humor. So yeah, uh, that's right. don't, don't take yourself too serious because exactly. nobody else does. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So how big was Boise PD when you got on? How many, uh, how many sworn did you have? Oh, shit. Roughly. Oh, I'd probably say two. 250 maybe i mean you, you guys were a good sized department yeah we're the capital city it's big enough you know and uh uh in most places you go to like oregon salem oregon mm-hmm. it's not the biggest place i mean it's it's a small sl- suburb but boise i think are you the biggest city in idaho oh yeah by far by far yeah and, and that's it, a, and that's an anomaly my, yeah yeah when i got hired i mean we had a horse unit these dudes were riding around on horses, you know, in uniform and, you know, they got rid of that because it was expensive. Anybody that owns a horse knows how much they, the upkeep is expensive, but yeah, I just, uh, that's about what it was about two seventy five, And, uh, I went to the, we have our, for the entire state of Idaho, our police academies in a town called Meridian, which is just right next to Boise. Then now they're kind of disconnected, but there used to be a little bit of a gap, but now there's not. And uh, that's where the EVOC course is and all the, you know, all the stuff. And they, they run a jail so, academy. Yep, this tell everybody what the acronyms are. We know what oh, they are. Uh, em- uh, driving, emergency vehicle. Emergency vehicle operations. Uh, uh, yeah. Where you the learn how to pit stuff. cars and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the fun stuff. The fun the stuff. The fun stuff. And hey, so, now, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. If it's if noise is spelled N-O-I-S-E, why isn't it just boys? Why isn't it not noisy? Well, you know, if somebody's not from here, they call it Boise with a Z. Mm-hmm. And if you're from here, they, it's Boise with an S. I don't know. Boise. Boise, yeah. Don't ever call it Boise. And a lot of yeah. people do that. <laughs> and if you guys That's have like, any juice at all, call Boise State and tell them to get rid of the blue turf because it's my number one most hated thing in the world, is that stupid <laughs> blue turf. And I, I will saw get that. punched in the mouth if half the city hears me say that. <laughs> so but I've never I, liked it. <laughs> first time I flew into Boise, not Z, but yep. Boise, mm-hmm. I saw that and I'm going, you, that's, that's how you land aircraft in Boise. Trust you just me. follow the freaking blue turf. Man. Yeah, but it's, everybody knows you see that blue field, you know who you're watching on TV. Amen. And that's why they keep it is because yep. it, Boise state is synonymous with the blue turf. Yep. yep. And I growing up playing football my whole life from fourth grade until high, end of high school. All I played on was grass. I played every Optimus. Optimus football is a, like a Pee Wee in Boise. We had what uh, I played little games there. All my high school games were at the at the stadium in at Boise State, and it was always green. And then for some reason, somebody some wingnut thought that they were gonna, and they turned it blue. And it's probably the best thing they ever did as far as, far as notoriety goes. But from I a hate recruiting it. and standpoint, yeah, when um, Peterson ridiculous. was there, yeah, but yeah, Chris you got, Peterson. And, yeah, and when you beat Oklahoma, you oh. know, in that bowl game with that final play, the Statue of Liberty that? play. Are you kidding me? That was one of the – if it wasn't even Boise State, that was one of the best football games I've ever seen in my life. And what a way to end it. It took a lot of cojones uh, to call that kind of play because, you know, a lot of people want to play it safe. And I'll give I'll give Peterson credit, man. They went for the win. Balls the size of church bells. Yeah, that was a great call. I'm glad you brought that up. Good job. Yeah. I remember that stuff. Go Irish this year. We'll see what happens. Well, let's let's start getting into – let's start setting the stage now for your one story. One second. One second. You know my yeah. favorite college team is Notre Dame, right? Fucking A. I go oh, no. to South now. Bend all the time. Come on. Come on. I did my graduate work there. My Are you dad taught me? RTC there. My dad taught RTC. I was living Shut in up. Mishawaka, and we would go – I would go over to the practice field and watch – and that, that Joe Thiesman and Eric Parsegan. <laughs> That's, you know, I used to tell him to shut up all the time. He never shut up either. What did, did he pay you to say that? Kevin? No, Come I would on, fly. Man. My best friend and I, we'd fly to uh, uh, Chicago. We'd rent a Geo Spec or whatever. We'd drive to. He first time he bought a hotel in Michigan City, Indiana. Have you ever been there? Ghetto yeah. as hell. I walked in and I look at the carpet. I go, "Is this blood or bong water? I don't even know what this is." There's a burned out <laughs> car in the parking lot. 
Just whatever you do, don't take your shoes off in the hotel room. No, I slept clothed. I mo- oh God, I don't even <laughs> tell you. But we would go Friday night. We would watch a hockey game, and then Saturday we'd go, you know, and watch the my, the fight in Irish and Notre Dame. Um, yeah, I love it. I love that campus. The hit the the history. Listen, it's my favorite nap. college I'm team just because of that. Up you're done. And during the fall when the colors are out, yes. and you got touchdown Jesus oh. there, and you can go to the grotto. And, yes, you know, I've all been that. to the grotto. And then on game day, here come the players walking back from mass, yeah. and you're high-fiving. A- we had uh, one of the kids that went to my da- – was in high school with my daughter, uh, Andrew Nuss, went to – got a scholarship to Notre Dame. So wow. we were up there when he was a senior Oof. and got a chance to go see him uh, – of course, that was the year fucking Charlie Weiss lost to Navy. Don't talk to me about Charlie oh. Weiss because I'm going to lose my mind if you do. <laughs> All right, let us I continue. Hate Charlie on. Weiss. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> and now back to our ESPN call in line. Caller, go ahead. Murph. Get ready, fans. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Are y'all done now? <laughs> yeah, we'll stop. We'll stop talking about. Notre All Dame I got. Football. All I got to say is go Mountaineers. Ears. Go ears. Hey, yeah. No, I got no problem with the Mountaineers. <laughs> but they're not okay. the Irish. Let's fit. They're let's not move the Irish. Boys. Let's right. here come the yeah. Irish. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I to here, mute, cheer but, for old Notre, Notre Dame. Dame. Yeah. Wake up the yeah. echoes, yeah. cheering yeah. her name. Yep. Wake up the echo. Right. Yeah. <laughs> let's. I, you want to see? I'll sing <laughs> hey. the whole song with you, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, you, you know that pain you were going through a while ago. I'm feeling your pain, brother. <laughs> you guys are killing me here. If you're a real hardcore fan, you can actually sing the intro to it. Rally, sons of Notre oh. Dame, sing her glory and sound her fame. All Race listeners her gold on Game of Crimes, I apologize to you. for Notre Dame. Right. Awesome. Not <laughs> a kid. All right. Okay. And, and back to our regular. We did a major digression, so you yeah, guys just did. whipped oh, out a six pack, six pack, and get. Hey, you know what? I'm going to go back to drinking. <laughs> 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 All right, okay, back to where our regularly we? scheduled podcast. Oh. Well, we were talking about uh, you're on the PD, so let's let we, let's start laying the groundwork for uh, your event. So um, let's start talking about you know, kind of take us through the progression. What did you what, what did you work through? What kind of units were you in? What did you do? And then what were you in before we start talking about the shooting? Okay. Um. I mean, everybody starts off in patrol, right? So you're out there with an FTO, start on patrol. You go through FTO, you gr- you get through that, and then you're on your own. Field training officer, just your for field folks. training officer, and then uh, you have to work in patrol for three years before you go to any. We call them specialty units, like whether it's detective or canine handler or fuck it, or bike unit, whatever, a specialty unit. So you have to work three years in patrol, which I worked night shift pretty much my entire career. Because that's where every where the fun is. That's where it is. Yep. And, and what was night shift for you? What was the hours? Uh, nine thirty to six thirty. Ten hour shifts, or so or eight thirty to six thirty. Did you guys work four tens then? Yeah, four tens. Did you um, rotate shifts or no? Pardon? Did you rotate shifts at all? Well, we do it by a, a druther program, and it's by seniority. So the longer you're there, you can pick what shift you want. If you're brand new, you're going to get stuck on, you know, you know, night shift or so all the young guys go to night shift because those older guys don't want to work. Well, night. they can't stay awake that long. I know. That was, I, when I was young, I could stay up all night, go do something during the day. No, I went from nights to swings and then, which is from, you know, one thirty in the afternoon or two thirty until midnight. And then I, and then my last, when I got shot, I worked day shift, first day shift of my entire life. And I loved it. It was awesome. Wow. So for three years, you're working the mean streets of Boise. So I worked three years, um, patrol night shift. And then I became friends with a couple of the guys on the team. And then we decided that we we're going to go to, we have another specialty unit called, uh, we just call it the bar team. And it was eight officers and we ran in two man cars and we had a canine assigned to us and in downtown Boise they call it the bar district there's like 75 bars in like a three block area and they have food trucks and is that because of the college uh probably i don't know it's just always kind of been that way some are really cool where they have like a bluegrass band some are more of a disco type or I, god there's my age disco a dance a dance disco. club and uh disco jesus um and so yeah, we knew yeah. what you're talking about but that was <laughs> can't you see them walking down the street you can yeah, tell yeah. But use my word <laughs> but that was one of the funnest times i ever had because i mean it was every night 
the second the bars closed at 2 a.m. in Boise, everybody would line up in front of all the food carts to get whatever. And there's like 75 food trucks and carts down there. And of course, you know, you're drunk, you're whatever. Somebody doesn't like your belt buckle. Does somebody that says something about your girlfriend and the fight was on. And it was always every night. It was a lot of fun, you know, when you're younger and you want to. But then, like I was telling Steve the other day, I did that for about five years maybe six years. And then from there, let me think of what I did. I be, I got a, oh, I went into what's called a uh, community policing team, which is, is essentially a street, like a street crimes unit. Uh, you live in a neighborhood, you call, you say, these people just moved in. I don't know what's going on. There's 40 cars a day showing up there. And at that time, meth was the king in Boise, meth and heroin. And so it w- we would do, that's where I learned to do drug investigations, write search warrants, do search warrants, um, et cetera. So I did that for a couple of years and then I got on, they had an opening on our SWAT team, which really appealed to me. So I tested, I got first place in that after the, all the rigmarole you have to go through. And then, uh, so I... So, hey, wait a second. When you got on SWAT, how big were you now? What do you mean, how big? Size-wise? Physically. It's not a true question. Yeah, it's not oh, a true question. Oh, I didn't know question. if like, I was a big guy or like literally, okay, metaphorically yeah. big. No, I was, shit, I've always been two and a quarter, 220. How tall are you? Well, now I'm 3'8". I was 6'1". <laughs> what a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little okay. shorter, man. Really Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up, though. I appreciate it. <laughs> I, how to was, to I said, how tall were you? Not well, how tall are yeah, you? I was, I was, I, I was okay. I could hold my own. We'll put it that way. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's a good size for being on a SWAT team too. Yeah. We had what's called the Clydesdales, which was actually, when you talk to Brian, he and I were on the Clydesdale where we would do the PT test together. And, you know, we were the, if you weighed 220 or more, you were, and we had dudes that were 140, right. That could run like the wind. And Brian and I are out there doing the 800 meter dummy drag and we're just, and we, we have no speed, right? We're just too big. And he, you know, he played linebacker and stuff in college football. And so it was a lot of fun that way, but I got on the team and then I stayed in the NCOs. I ended up uh, working a program where I got a narcotics dog because we did so many, you know, we would surveil a house and a car would leave and we'd do a traffic stop on it. And we never had a you know, we say, can we look in your car? And they'd say, no, then we're kind of screwed. But in Idaho, you know, you can run a narcotics dog around the car. He'd hit on it or not hit on it. And, and that, that was a real game changer for sure, because we really started crushing people doing that. It was a lot of fun. And then ultimately we had an opening in narcotics, our vice narcotics unit. And I tested, um, you tested positive. Yeah. What? <laughs> I tested for the position. <laughs> Is that a requirement to test positive yes, to get into yes. the narcotics? You have human? to be a hardcore addict. Up, and uh, <laughs> don't give up all our secrets. No, here, so man. ultimately, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got a, it's called Bandit, which is an acronym for Boise Area Narcotics Drug Interdiction Team. How about that one? But we just called it Bandit. Wow. So I got on it with Bandit, and uh, holy shit, you talk about a new level of learning. The curve on that is very steep, and so you said you had a dog, so you obviously had to go through the canine handling yep. training mm-hmm. and everything, yep. right? His name was Huck. He was a black lab. Uh, absolute. He's the gold standard for, for drug dogs. He ended up just being a superstar. And, you know, we had a, a bunch of apprehension dogs, Mal, Malinois. I think we have mm-hmm. eight. Those are crazy I, motherfuckers, by the way. I'm ve- Well, <laughs> I am very leery of them. But I also have a love for him because we had a a Mal named Jardo that was assigned to the SWAT unit because he was quiet. He didn't whine or anything, which is, they, they have a tendency to get real amped up. And Jardo saved my life, too, and got shot and killed when I got shot. The bad guy, Marco Romero, shot Jardo, oh, and man. he died. And so I got shot five times. Chris got shot once, and Jardo got shot once, and he died. And so that's probably just, the hardest thing because as a, as a, I mean, I'm a dog lover. Like you cannot, mm-hmm. if it, I just, 
I, I just love dogs, love animals in general, but dogs especially. And to have a canine lay it down for you, um, that's just. That's you know what they heart, say about dogs? Dogs are the only animals that love you yeah. more than they love themselves. It, mm -hmm. it was, I, 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 it's, it's hard for me to talk about, and it's still to this day, and it's been, whatever, six years now. And I, uh, when I talk about well, let's, Garlo, it's the hardest thing for me to talk about. It's, it's very heart-wrenching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's amazing considering what you went through, what your partner went through and that the effect the dog has on you. But so let's go back and set this up now because we kind of let people know where we're going. So let's talk about how did you get into this? You're on Bandit. You guys are working stuff. So now are you guys just doing, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, just doing street stuff, you know, make, doing hand to hand stuff or you just pop in doing uh, proactive policing? What's the what's the mandate? What's the remit of your unit? What are you guys doing? We're doing long term covert cases. And we worked a lot with okay. the DEA office here and the ATF office. We needed the DEA for their money. If we started doing, you know, to, uh, you know, if, if we started doing a trip, uh, the triple I, God, I already forgot. The by -walks. No, uh, we would do a, a wire case. Uh, oh, title, title three, three is what I was looking at, triple I. Yeah. Title three. So we would. Triple I is for those folks who are wondering. That's the Interstate Identification Index. That's where you go to to find out if somebody has a f record. God, Morgan, the nerd, right? See? Good job, <laughs> dude. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you in the pre -call? You did. You said I mean, watch out for nerd, Morgan because right? he's a state trooper, and you just hit a, hit it out yeah. of the park, dude. My I I did a lot of <laughs> stuff down at the Department of Justice. Other I, stuff. Also, my, my excuse <laughs> yeah. is when I got shot, I fell forward and hit my head, and I got a brain bleed, and I ended up. Well, you were a fucking center. That should have been fine. Well, I can't on believe you. this thick of a skull. <laughs> Look at this jaw and this head. I wear like a, almost a size eight hat. It's ridiculous. I can't even believe it <laughs> happened. But so sometimes I forget stuff. But um, uh, we would do. Oh, like you owe me fifty bucks, okay. by the way. Sounds good. <laughs> I, I remember I owed you that. No, we would do. Sometimes they were small <laughs> stuff. Sometimes they were just like a, a teen or a meth. Sometimes they were a few balloons of heroin. You know, but every, but we would always try like anybody else to get, you know, the bigger ones. And we started getting into cases where we're doing pound quantities of meth or heroin. And, uh, you know, we would use the DEA and they would send people down from Se their Seattle field office to, because they're always Hispanic dudes, Mexicans that once we started getting into big quantities, it all came from Mexico, which you, you're aware of that, just like fentanyl and stuff. So we had to have translators and shit. It would be a six month case. And depending if you were doing the undercover work or I never, I never personally did a federal case, but we had guys in our unit that did and they were good and bad, but we'd end up doing, you know, we'd have shit, 28 indictments after six months and we'd do 16, 17 search warrants all simultaneously. We'd use surrounding agency, that kind of stuff. Then ultimately I like doing undercover work. Um, it was fun and scary but then i did a two year two and a half year case at the very end of my bandit career and uh it was with a, a an o omg i don't know what you call them back east we call them omgs uh, outlaw motorcycle gang outlaw motorcycle gang, or whatever yeah. you want to call it yep mm -hmm. uh, i did a two and a half year case there which was something else to say the least and then at the end when everything went down I mean, we even had, uh, I, I won't get into some of the details because I think some of it, even to this day, I still live in Boise and some of these guys do too. And uh, I'm not necessarily scared of them, but it's just one of those things where it's probably best if, you know, I don't get into, like I say, some of the details, but we worked a lot with ATF. I went down to their uh, LA to their, their field office in LA, talked to a lot of the undercover ATF guys that infiltrated the mongols and ha and you know vagos and all those dudes and uh we ultimately uh i learned a lot from them because we didn't know what we were doing shit we just kind of stumbled and i was doing the undercover work for the gang unit it wasn't a narcotics unit but we ended up obviously getting involved in narcotics and riding harleys and doing all that shit so it was a lot of fun but it was also a little hairy for obvious reasons and then we had a uh, we had one guy in our unit that went sideways and we ended up getting the unit ended up getting investigated by the FBI over his actions and he got fired for it. Thank God. 
And if I what so high level, what did this guy do that went sideways? Oh, well, he violated rule number one, which is don't fuck your CIs. Guys, and then, there we go. Yep. Uh, and he went, what do we what do we say earlier? What gets you in trouble? Yes. You know? That's it. It'll get your badge. You can get as yep. much pussy as you want, but your badge is gonna get that pussy's gonna get your badge. And that's essentially what happened. So it turned into a big rigmarole. I it was a long deal. I got tired of it. Um then I said, you know what? I've got a few years to go. I want to go back to patrol. I miss being a policeman. My daughters were getting older. They didn't want me to go to their school. And keep in mind, I have two daughters. And at the time, they were maybe eight and 10, something like that. What do you mean they didn't want you to go to because their school? Because I looked like a complete scrote bag. I looked like shit. I had a beard down to here. I had long hair. I mean, they're like, Dad, if you don't want to go back to te- to the to meet the teacher night, it's okay. And I embarrassed them by the way uh, I look. Well, we had Ken Croak on here, uh, ATF mm-hmm. guy who who uh, only on, only federal law enforcement officer to penetrate the pagans and become a fully mm-hmm. patched member of pagan. He came home one time and he ran a boyfriend off. He says, "I think I'm going to stay like this. I think I'll stay in. Uh, I'll, I'll stay undercover like this. You know, till my daughters quit dating." <laughs> no, it it doesn't work no. like that. And plus, I'd been doing it for I don't know seven years, and so I had kind of had about a belly full of it. So when you transitioned out, you went back to patrol. How many years on Boise did you have at that oh, time? God, probably nine, nineteen, eighteen years. Wow. So what's your retirement plan there too? Is it a 20 and out or 25? Well, we or? have, uh, it's called Percy, which is your public employees retirement system. And we have what's called the rule of 80, which is your age and years of service have to yeah, add up years to 80. Of service and your, and to your retire age. 55% of, yeah, f- to, so you could retire at 55% of what you couldn't afford to live on in the first That's place. exactly right. You got it figured out. And so I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go and just be a patrolman. And I went to day shift, which was Tuesday, no, Monday through Thursday. So I had Friday, Saturday, Sundays off. And I absolutely loved it. I was still doing, we're a part-time SWAT team. We're not a full-time just because we don't have the ability for the personnel to do it. And uh, I'm going to send Steve Murphy. A picture of me. This is two days before I went back to patrol. I wonder if you can see this. Oh my God. I, you were right there. That's enough reasonable suspicion to p- pull your ass over and pat you down for what? That was me. I, I, I looked way worse than that back in the day. I loved it. But you looked a little thinner in that picture, eh, too. Maybe a little bit. Could be. Could be. But that was my, it was at a gas station. I bought a little bit of dope from a dude and my partner who drove me there is like this is your and i went to patrol two days later shaved everything off worked day shift loved it did they recognize you after you shaved in fact i went to a domestic (laughs) where one of the (laughs) with one of the guys you had worked on before in his front room (laughs) and he doesn't he has no clue who i am and i'm just sitting there giggling to myself and i'm like jesus christ man these guys are dumber than hell (laughs) And so, but it's all situational is what I learned. Like I've been pulled over by cops that I knew and they didn't even know who I was. Like I'd come in the station and cause it, it's all, like I say, situational, like people go, don't yep. they recognize you? And they go, not really, because they called the police when I was doing undercover work, I wasn't the police. And so it, it was just one mm-hmm. of those things. And it was, I had a lot of fun. I mean, I did some crazy shit, the vice stuff. I wasn't really down with Asian massage parlors, glory hole patrol. We called it. All the bullshit, all the prostitution, hated it, all of it. The most uncomfortable thing I've ever done is doing that, calling up with some skanky hooker to sit in a hotel room while your buddies are next door giggling because you're, and they've got you filmed, which makes it even worse. (laughs) Jesus, it was the worst. I don't like doing vice work. I don't know how guys do that in bigger cities, but vice work was no good for me. I hated it. (laughs) I'm looking at this picture. You ought to sold dope yeah, to you. I, I, bought a, <laughs> I bought a lot of dope. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, let's, so let's start, let's start getting, um, let, let's get into it. So when everything happens, uh, so let's start setting the stage for this event. So walk us into it now. Okay. Um, on November 9th, 
of 16. Okay, I, I need to back up. And I told Steve this a little bit, but the Idaho Department of Corrections came up with a really great idea called the Justice Reinvestment Initiative. And California has done it. Other states have done it where they said, we need to save money. How are we going to save money? Well, we're going to. By getting, by releasing people out of prison Simone, earlier. That's exactly what it is. That California is called Rule 234 yeah. or something or something like that, where you would let people out. Um, to yeah, save money. That's what it is. And they lied. They said that, well, they were going to use this money for better training for per parole officers, which they never did. Um, the guy that shot me wasn't supposed to be out of prison until 2026. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.